Um, our next topic is financial aid and internship funding, which is a really important initiative for the university. Uh, we're joined now by Murray Decock, Vice President of Institutional Advancement and a member of the great Colgate class of 1980, as well as Mike Shiola, Associate Vice President for Advancement and Director of Career Services. Welcome, Murray and Mike. Thank you, Emily. Uh, Mike, ready to go? I am. I love talking about financial aid. You know why? Why is that? Because financial aid absolutely changed my life. And I've watched financial aid change the lives of thousands of other Colgate students who otherwise wouldn't come to this wonderful campus. So I'm not going to go back to that uh, distant history, though. I'm going to start with a more recent history and talk about the story at the end of the last campaign. So uh, if you recall, we raised $132 million in endowment in financial aid the last campaign and $10 million in spendable aid. Financial aid was the single most successful designation in the campaign. As you saw, we far exceeded our $87.5 million goal. We don't have all $142 million in yet, of course. There are some pledges that we're gradually collecting, and some are estate provisions that we hope won't come to us for a long time. Now, when the campaign ended, uh, we decided to keep the momentum going. And since then, you can see we've raised uh, another $45 million in financial aid endowment. You can see that this year we've been especially productive, and I'm going to talk about why in a couple of minutes uh, toward the end of this presentation. Now, here's a very busy slide, but I want you to focus on the column that says percentage on aid. And you can see back in 2009, the class of 2009, uh, we were at 36.4% students on aid. And since then, we've increased by seven percentage points, the number of students on aid on campus, which is a tremendous improvement. Uh, it's provided more access to this wonderful education. Uh, uh, for some, they think that it's morally the right thing to do. Uh, it improves Colgate socioeconomic diversity as well. And in doing so, I think really softens a lot of the edges uh, of the barbells that uh, are currently on campus, the, the haves and the have-nots. Competitive advantage, I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about that because I don't think we think of financial aid as a vehicle towards competitive advantage a lot of the time. So I'm going to go back to the busy, busy slide here, and I've got a different uh, column highlighted. No, I don't. I'm sorry. I should have the uh, aided target highlighted here. You see, we had 266 students uh, aided back in 2006, and uh, this past year we've had 329 students aided. That increase of 63 additional students that we're able to aid has provided us with a competitive advantage because for each student that we aid, we can send out three financial aid offers. So that's really allowed us to increase and expand our financial aid pipeline and draw in the kinds of students who need aid, who have all of the qualities and attributes for a Colgate education. So we're currently testing a... Uh, single initiative campaign for financial aid right now. We have some very exciting news to share on Monday night at the President's Club dinner at the Waldorf. Uh, we've had a wonderful commitment from an individual of $10 million towards financial aid, and he has helped us develop a partnership around getting other donors to uh, enrich and expand that number, which we will share with you early next week. Thanks, Murray. Um, so as the Director of the Career Services, um, I want to also thank our generous donors. Uh, financial aid is an incredibly important uh, initiative for Colgate. It helps us to bring the most talented students to campus uh, and helps us to make sure that the student population that we have on campus uh, is just extraordinary. So providing that opportunity for students to, uh, to get the, the wonderful Colgate experience and education they can have uh, without barrier uh, is incredibly important. I'm interested in talking about internships, uh, and in particular, uh, our fundraising initiatives around making sure that those students that are coming to campus uh, through our fundraising for financial aid initiatives and other students have access to the important uh, uh, experiences they can get from internships. There's a couple things that we know. The best educational outcome 
is when an extraordinary educational program and curriculum is matched with great opportunities for our students to immerse themselves in experiences where they get to try out uh, a lot of the knowledge that they've been acquiring, but also to match that with skills development. It does a couple things. It helps students certainly figure out what they're good at and what they're aiming for in terms of uh, careers, but also has a transformative effect in back in the classroom. When you've got a group of students who have all had this wonderful summer experience able to come back to the classroom and relate what they're studying with what they've experienced, it just raises the level of the discourse in the, in the, uh, in the, the course, which is great. A couple other things that we know about internships, they're becoming more and more important for students uh, in terms of their first career job as they're launching. More and more industries are using internships as the recruiting moment. So we at Colgate know that what we need to do is make sure that all of our students have equal access to getting those internships. So we need to do a good job of preparing them and to finding opportunities for them. But for students that are looking at an unpaid or a low paid internship, we need to also make sure that uh, an ability or finance is not a barrier. So making sure that they have the financial backing to be able to get these internships. So what we're doing is raising support for unpaid or low paid internships or for internships that have costs, additional costs. So say it's a paid internship, but it's in South Africa and it's expensive to get there. We want to make sure that this isn't a barrier for our students. Over the last few years, we've been raising money for a new initiative here, a Colgate Summer Internship Grant. Last year, we had 283 students uh, that were funded. This year we had 400 applications. You can see on the slide here uh, of, those, uh, of those applications uh, we were able to move forward 116 students that were given a grant uh, and we also have another 130 students that are on our wait list. The wait list is not because their uh, grant applications were not worthy, it's, it's because of a lack of funding. Um, there's some other statistics here. We, this was a competitive process, so students had to put together a grant application, and then we had a committee made up of faculty, staff, and alumni volunteers who juried uh, these applications were able to identify for us the, the top grants to move forward. This year, uh, so far, we've been able to raise $566,331. Uh, this has enabled us so far to fund 126 wow. students, which is just an extraordinary number. What we're uh, faced with is we have an additional 52 students that are on the wait list. These students have uh, opportunities that they're hanging on to, hoping that we can find the funds for them to support them in doing. Each one of these is worthy. I've put a couple um, examples of what students have in terms of an internship that are waiting for funding. So everything from uh, an internship working in Washington, D.C. in the U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, working at Christie's in New York City in an educational uh, research internship where they're doing background uh, research, original research on some of the items that Christie's are going to put up. Uh, to uh, a venture capital um, incubator in Washington, D.C. called uh, 1776 VC, a really interesting uh, uh, think tank and VC incubator. We have a student there. And then uh, for the School of Medicine uh, at uh, University of Pennsylvania and our very own sustainability office here on campus. All 52 of these students uh, have a viable internship. With your help, we're going to be able to support them and have a great outcome. It sounded like you were fundraising there, Mike. I was fundraising. That's my job. I was thanking. Yeah. Well, again, <clears throat> I think the combination of the impact of, the, of these internship endowment is so closely connected to the impact of financial aid because we get these wonderful students here, give them great opportunity, and then get them great opportunities to launch them to become professional uh, become successful professionals, but also become successful citizens. So these are all connected together. We can't thank you enough uh, for all of those who've answered the call for more financial aid resources. So thank you. Spoken like a true fundraiser, Murray. <laughs> uh, we have a couple questions for you, Murray, that were submitted uh, before the program. 
Um, first, can you provide an update as to where we are with regards to the presidential search? Sure. From what I know, and I know they've tried to communicate uh, quite a lot relative to where the uh, group in the process is. Um, I think you've all been made aware that there is a large committee that's being created. The chair of the committee is Mike Hurling, class of 1979, a trustee. There are nine trustees on the committee. The faculty elected six faculty members to join them. There is one student and one member of the senior staff as well. Their first order of business was to hire a consultant, Spencer Stewart, uh, which is a new consultant uh, for us for senior level searches. Uh, and then the group went to work uh, sitting down with a number of uh, constituencies on campus and off campus. I'm not sure how many meetings exactly, but to get feedback and um, a number of four on campus uh, to hear what kinds of attributes, what kinds of uh, uh, traits should we be looking for in our next uh, president. All of that information was collected and then with the help of the consultants in the committee they sat down to create a presidential position statement which I'm not sure has been made public but they're going to use that to inform their job description. I expect over the next uh, two to three months that they will, uh, I already know there's been a number of nominees, many nominees in fact, but they will be putting together this job description and uh, putting it into proper publications, into the hands of proper individuals to start uh, eliciting applications. I'm, my sense is that they would start with a, a number of airport interviews, maybe 10, and then probably whittle it down to two or three on-campus interviews uh, sometime in the fall with the hope that a, a leader of Colgate would be named by no later than December 2015. These people are typically involved, enmeshed, immersed, in uh, fairly uh, large responsibilities, so would not be able to start until the following uh, June or July anyway, so that would be 2016. It's a long process, it's an important process, and because of the complex nature of the academy, I think it's important to engage all of the different constituencies to make sure that everybody uh, feels like they were heard as we put together the description, and everyone gets a chance to uh, look at the candidates as they come on board. Great. Thank you so much for that update. Our second question for you, Murray. In what ways has the campus climate changed since the sit-in at the admissions office last semester? Wow. Well, you know, the best way to, to find out about campus climate is to ask the students uh, instead of an old dude like myself. Um, but I, I have become uh, more immersed in, uh, in the students since the sit-in. Uh, on a daily basis, walked up and down the stairs where the students were sitting in as we met as a senior staff to work through the sit-in. Um, you know, I think there's more awareness just in general uh, that there are a large number of students that are uh, feeling disenfranchised on campus. Uh, again, I don't think that social media um, uh, yik-yak is much help. Uh, there are a lot of knuckleheads, but as I've gone to my children's ca campuses, I've seen that there are equal number of knuckleheads on those campuses as well. Um, that try to undermine, I think, the unity or bonds that students might be trying to build on campus. I think a couple of things have emerged though, that have been really important. Uh, one is through the faculty have made a commitment on their own, volunteered to become engaged in a program called Intergroup Dialogue because they've realized that they've, uh, they, they're now teaching on a campus that has a vastly changed uh, demographic. Uh, and that's going back to our financial aid conversation, I guess you can say that the increase in financial resources are partly to blame. Uh, through financial aid, we've really been able to change uh, the, the makeup of our campus over the last 10 years. And I think a lot of the teachers who came in, the professors who came in teaching a certain way, now have to teach to a much more varied, more diverse uh, a classroom. And that's not uh, just multiculturally, but it's also socioeconomically diverse. A lot of first generation uh, college students, um, our OUS program as well, which is, is burgeoning. So I think that has been very successful and has led to probably um, uh, better classroom experiences. And then just socially, uh, Advancement has worked with the Dean of the College in trying to partner together in, uh, in supporting these kids, understanding some of the social uh, barriers that are created by, I think, a, a social infrastructure that's more backward looking than forward looking. So as a result, there's going to be the uh, creation and announcement of a first generation program. Uh, going into the next uh, academic year. The OUS program, as I mentioned, is being refurbished and, and reinforced and, and resourced the way it should be. Uh, the, um, 
uh, the, the amount of resources, mentors, advisors for these students is going to be paid attention to. Again, and I also think that uh, Susie and I, the Dean of the College, Susie Nelson and I, have looked at uh, perhaps the uh, college putting on more all-campus events and trying to pool resources as opposed to have students go off with smaller amounts of resources in, in sort of fractured communities in which they have fun, but in which they don't have the opportunity to blend more with uh, other students that they actually want to socialize with. So I think improvement, but we can always improve, and I look forward to uh, a launch next fall. Great response, Murray. Uh, Mike, we have a couple questions from you that have been submitted through the live stream chat. The first is from Dan McDowell, and Dan wants to know, how do you measure the effectiveness of career services? Aha, that's great. So um, a couple different ways. Uh, one of the things that we have been doing um, since I got here is taking a look at a lot of our metrics. So percentage of engagement of each class, uh, we're taking a look at not only how many students are coming in, but the frequency uh, and what are some of the topics that we're working with. When I got here, the focus was really on juniors and seniors, which seems to be the natural fit for career services. What we've done is put a lot of resources and effort into programming for our first year students and our second year students. So we've seen a huge uptick in the number of first and second year students that are using career services. This year so far, we're over 90% of the freshman class, for example, have been in using career services. So that's one way that we're looking, is how are students engaging? That doesn't tell us everything, though, because we want to look at outcomes. We want to know that uh, by using career services, they are actually getting uh, some focus. They're understanding themselves and where in the world there would be opportunities. So what we're doing now is starting to track those four years. Uh, and so that there's a progression, so that we are setting uh, broad goals with students in their first year, setting out a program in their sophomore year. We're doing a lot more uh, support and help for them to explore the world of work. We're tracking how many of them are then getting internships after their sophomore year. In their junior year, certainly as they've chosen their major, we're taking a look at how we've been working with them. And then certainly we're looking at first destinations data as our seniors are graduating and where our students are landing their first time in. We just finished our survey of the class of 2014. We had uh, almost 89% uh, of the class reporting in. And between a job, a graduate school, a competitive fellowship, or a significant volunteer position, we had over 97% of the class of 14 placed, if you will, by December of the year they graduated. So we're looking at all these different metrics. Ultimately, what we want to be able to do is to say to an incoming freshman, if you use career services this way, we have predictive data that you'll have these kinds of outcomes. So lots of different ways. That's great. That's very helpful. We have another question for you, Mike, from Devin Skerritt. Devin wants to know, how do you see co-curricular training programs and MOOCs, um, the online mm -hmm. uh, platform, helping students get experiences for first destination hiring? Great, great question. Um, thanks, Devin. Good to hear from you, too. I know, Devin. Um, well, we're taking a look at... Uh, at where some of the work that career services can do to fill in uh, critical skills and uh, competencies for our students. So we know, for example, that uh, employers are looking not only for a great academic program and evidence of things like leadership and uh, involvement, but they're actually looking for some specific skills as well. Quantitative uh, ability, so being able to uh, use and manipulate numbers to be able to prove uh, theories or to uh, move an organization to a goal. Specific leadership skills uh, and strategic management, so not just being part of a group, but evidence that they have learned how to move a group forward. Uh, we're looking at uh, things like uh, how do we help students understand not only uh, how to work and be successful in a diverse um, population or a diverse world, but actually how to use that talent pool, that diverse talent pool towards strategic goals. So what we're taking a look at is a management leadership program. 
uh, generously funded uh, by Bob Fox, one of our uh, great alumni, uh, partnering with The Cove, partnering with uh, the Center for Leadership and Student Involvement and others so that we can start looking at how do we marry this great Colgate educational experience with things like internships and entreeships and apprenticeships with the specific skills that employers are telling us that they need. Uh, you're asking about MOOCs. Here's a great example. Uh, we have an accounting course on campus. Uh, the wait list is about four times as large as the actual seats. So we're looking at how can we encourage students to go to like MIT, for example, and to get the accounting course under their belt, and then how can you talk to employers or potential employers about what they've learned. We're thinking about how we can marry that with opportunities to bring alumni back to actually give us some case studies uh, where students can take a very practical accounting class that they learned online and apply it uh, in the classroom so that they then can bring that forward on their resumes and as a candidate. Great, thank you. Uh, we have one more question for Murray from Brian Applegate. Brian actually asked a two-part question, but we're running low on time, so I'm gonna only ask the second, which is uh, what was it like to play professional hockey for the New York Islanders? <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Uh, I don't know because I didn't play for the New York Islanders. So I signed with the Winnipeg Jets, though, who were just knocked out of the playoffs. So I'm quite despondent right now. What's the second part of that one? We're the first. Uh, the first one was about the endowment. So if you wanted to share a quick update on the endowment, you are welcome to do so if you can keep it to a minute. Uh, the performance of the endowment at the last uh, quarter, I believe, was $890 million, which is absolutely fantastic. I think the investment committee has done a wonderful job managing uh, what, what we consider to be scant resources considering the sandbox that we play in. If you remember back in the global recession, uh, we were at a high of 740 million, went down to $540 million to get back up to $890 million and have very little downside risk and also a good upside opportunity is a wonderful opportunity for the students who are here and for the thousands of students who are yet to come. So thanks for that question, Brian, and thanks for uh, all you've done to help support the endowment, both in terms of gifts and in guidance. Thank you both for joining us this afternoon. Those were some really great updates to share, and obviously financial aid and internship funding are two really important initiatives for the university, and I know that they're initiatives that a lot of our alumni and parents care about as well. So if listening to that presentation has inspired you to help support financial aid or internships, I would encourage you to visit colgate.edu slash make a gift. Um, I also wanted to share the update since we were speaking w about uh, MOOCs, which are the open online courses, that Colgate's first um, outward facing MOOC, meaning that um, anyone can participate in the course and not just alumni, launched yesterday, Greeks at War with Professor Robert Garland. And if you'd like to join in on that online course, you can visit colgate.edu slash colgatex.